Hey everyone, today's video is going to be covering colonic diverticulitis. Uh, like all our videos, we're going to focus on the key points of pathophysiology and common presentations. And so once again, thinking about everything's in the name in medicine, we see itis and diverticula. So a diverticula is just an outpouching and an itis is an infection of that outpouching. And while these can happen anywhere along the GI tract, the most common place for diverticulitis to present is in the colon. So when we talk about diverticulitis without specifying the organ, we're typically just talking about colonic diverticulitis. And so the presentation, this one can be pretty vague. Uh, the most common symptom is just abdominal pain, most commonly in the left lower quadrant where your sigmoid is, but it can potentially be anywhere. And depending on how severe their disease is, they might be showing signs of systemic infection as well with fever, chills, tachycardia, et cetera. With the way medicine uh, has gone and the common availability of CT scans, these are most commonly diagnosed uh, via CT in the emergency department. And so to think about the pathophysiology, we've got to think about how the colon is put together. So there's generally accepted to be four layers of the colon which I will draw with my best efforts here. So this is layer one, that would be the mucosa. Then underneath that, there's a submucosa. Underneath that, there's a muscular layer. And then below that, there's the thin serosa, which is our fourth layer. And so what we really need to think about in terms of diverticula is there's true or false diverticula. And a true diverticula would be if all of these components of the colon wall protruded out through the outpouching. And a false one would be if one of these layers does not come out with the diverticula or, or more typically thought of as there's a defect in a layer that's allowing the other contents to herniate out through it. And colonic diverticula are typically false diverticula, and they usually protrude through this third layer, the muscular layer of the colon wall. And when we think about it, this makes sense, right? Because the colon, while it has two layers, two muscular layers, just like the small bowel, you've got to remember that there's one of those layers is concentrated in the tenia coli. So if we have some houster here and here, there's these three tenia coli that run longitudinally throughout the colon. So anywhere where there's not a tenia, all this space in between actually only has a single muscular layer. And that muscular layer then gets perforated by these straight blood vessels called the vasorecta. And at those areas, there's thought to be some structural weakness that can predispose to this formation of colonic diverticula. Or if we're thinking about it pictorially over here, we could imagine that there's some sort of defect here in the muscular layer and there's a protrusion or outpouching of the colon right there. And once again, we don't really know what causes this. I just talked about some potential structural reasons for having diverticulosis. However, historically, there have been other causes that people have investigated. There were a lot of studies of different types of diet or fiber contents, uh, but none of those have completely panned out. And then there's some thought about issues with motility disorders because these are found typically in the sigmoid colon and the sigmoid colon has the highest intraluminal pressures of anywhere in the colon. So there's thought that maybe some people are predisposed to have higher colonic pressures and are more likely to have higher rates of diverticular disease. But in any event, that's still being discovered and not, not terribly applicable for our purposes here. We go, clear that. And so now when we think about the pathophysiology of this disease, we have serosa, muscularis, and then we have the submucosa and mucosa herniating through this area. So we have a clonic diverticula right here. Typically, we think that something kind of like appendicitis or even gallbladder disease, that something comes in and plugs up this outpouching, maybe a small piece of stool. This used to be why people thought a lot about like popcorn or nuts, that maybe that would predispose you to diverticulitis, although that has not panned out uh, in the literature. But either way, if there's some sort of obstruction here, once again, you block a single-ended tube, and then you're going to get an infection in this area. 
And so as that infection builds up, you get more and more inflammation, more and more pressure building up, and that's either going to lead to some local inflammation and infection, or can potentially build up enough pressure to perforate out into the abdomen itself. And then depending on how severe the disease is, we like to classify diverticul diverticulitis into these Hinchy classifications. And typically we talk about one through four. I included zero on here because actually most diverticulitis is class zero and non-perforated. So it's important for us to talk about that. But then we've also got what we most commonly deal with surgically, Hinchy class one through class four going from least severe to most severe. And we're going to talk about how we manage these different presentations of diverticulitis on the upcoming slides. But the basics of what you need to know is the higher the Hinchy number, the more severe the diverticulitis and the more intensive the treatment. So for example, if you're picturing the colon here, obviously non-perforated diverticulitis, maybe you have just this little outpouching and there's just a little bit of inflammation on your CT scan but no obvious abscess, no obvious perforation, that would be a Hinchy zero. However, if there is a little micro perforation and then you get a little pocket of infection, a little abscess, but it's right there where the diverticulitis was, that's a class one or pericolonic abscess. The disease was severe enough, it perforated, you did get an abscess, but it stayed right in that initial spot. And then you can imagine that if, let's say my diverticulitis outpouching was right here, it perforated, but it perforated so much that it was able to move to a different part of the abdomen. And then we had an abscess over here. That would be a distal abscess and that would be Hinchy class two. And then the final two classifications are where there is no containment of the infection. So maybe I'll go back to this abscess right here. If this abscess just ruptured and now you had pus spilling all throughout the abdominal cavity, that would be Hinchy class three purulent peritonitis or just free flowing pus throughout the abdominal cavity causing peritonitis. And then lastly, and most severe is Hinchy class four, which is feculent peritonitis, which as you might guess by the name means that not just an abscess perforates, but actually your whole colon perforates and you're just leaking stool all over the belly causing really severe peritonitis and abdominal pain. And so then if we go back to our presentation, if you have somebody coming in with just some mild abdominal pain, no systemic symptoms, they're most likely to have very low severity Hinchy classification, probably a Hinchy zero. And then people coming in with diffuse generalized peritonitis, kind of like we talked about in our abdominal pain video, are most likely going to be Hinchy three or four. And then treatment is going to vary with severity with Non-severe diseases usually requiring just antibiotics and very severe disease usually requiring emergency surgery. So we'll go into the details for each process in the next couple slides. All right, so first Hinchy zero and that's non-perforated diverticulitis. Like we said, we've got our colon ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid. You can see this kind of S-shaped so like we mentioned earlier, most diverticular disease happens in the sigmoid. So we have our little outpouching, it gets blocked off, gets infected, and there's just a little bit of maybe haziness or inflammation on the CT scan. They feel a little bit bad, but they're really not acutely ill. Their abdominal exam is not too bad. And so this is Hinchy zero diverticulitis, and all it usually needs is a course of antibiotics, and it usually recovers. Uh, in more historical parlance, we would have called this uncomplicated diverticulitis. Sometimes people need to come into the hospital depending on how they're feeling, but a lot of times they can just get the course of antibiotics orally and go home, and this uh, takes care of itself on its own. So a lot of times we as surgeons don't even hear about this type of diverticulitis unless it becomes a really persistent problem for a patient. And then Hinchy class one and two, now we're talking about the different types of abscesses. So to review, we've got our colon, sigmoid coming down to rectum. And remember, it all depends on the severity of the disease and the perforations. We have our little outpouching, it gets plugged off, gets infected and bursts. And then if it bursts and it only bursts locally, there's just a little pocket of infection locally, that's a pericolonic abscess, that's Hinchy class one. But let's say it perfs here 
And then you actually get a distal abscess somewhere in the pelvis, a pelvic or a distal abscess, that would be Henschi class two. And so now we're dealing with abscesses. So these are a little bit harder to treat. So certainly you wanna start with antibiotics for everyone. However, if the abscess is big enough and if it's accessible enough, you might want to call interventional radiology and they will try to place a drain in the abscess and drain that infection. And that's usually a quite effective way to minimally, with a minimally invasive technique to drain the infection, not cause too much morbidity to the patient and let the area heal up. Uh, one thing to think about, so these patients usually do come into the hospital because you want to make sure they go in the right direction once you've drained their abscess or started them on antibiotics. And usually we monitor that by looking at their labs, their abdominal pain, whether or not they can tolerate PO. And if they're just smoldering into the hospital, maybe they've had a drain placed or maybe not, but they're not really getting better. You want to think about every five to seven days, that's usually how long it takes for a CT scan to change. So if they've been in the hospital five days and they're not really getting better, it might be time to think about getting a repeat CT. And a lot of times you'll see that maybe a small abscess that you didn't drain has gotten a lot bigger, or maybe an abscess that you did drain, there's just a pocket that wasn't completely accessed by the drain. And there's usually some sort of step that you can take at that time. But fortunately, most of these people, people do very well with their IR drains and their antibiotics, and they will get discharged from the hospital. And the big thing you have to think about is colon cancer. So common things being common, it's probably diverticulitis, but you can't rule out a perforated ca cancer in a patient presenting like this. So all these people, uh, usually around six weeks after they leave the hospital, when things have had a chance to heal up, should get a colonoscopy, make sure there's no hidden cancer uh, that has been missed. And then they can see a colorectal surgeon uh, where they can talk about potentially taking out their sigmoid on an elective basis to prevent this from happening again. All right, and to finish up, we're going to talk about our most severe presentations of diverticulitis, which is peritonitis. Remember, class three was just purulent peritonitis, where there's pus throughout the abdomen, and four, there's actually pus and stool throughout the abdomen because there's such a large, uncontained hole in the colon. And these people, as you might imagine, you've got uncontrolled infection throughout the abdomen. They need surgery to clean all of this out and uh, repair the damage in the hole in the colon. So I'll once again, embarrass myself by drawing a really bad colon. There we go. That should do it. So once again, we've got ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and down here would be your rectum. And so we'd like, like we talked about, most commonly disease happens in the sigmoid, whether that's due to colonic pressures or some other reason for diverticula to occur in the sigmoid most commonly. Uh, that's typically where we see diverticulitis. And so that's where our most common surgical options uh, deal with. They're used to dealing with that area. So the two surgeries you'll hear about are what's called a Hartman's procedure. This is the traditional approach. This is what been, has been done for a long time in surgery. And essentially what a Hartman's is, is where we find the disease segment of the colon. Let's say we're having a bunch of disease and inflammation right here. That's where the hole is. You take that part out, you take the, the rest of the sigmoid out as well, down to the rectum, remove that from the patient, and then this part of the descending colon actually comes up to the abdominal wall for an ostomy. And this part down here is called your rectal stump, and that's just gonna be a closed off portion of the rectum where mucus and residual stool can drain out still through the anus, but there's no continuity between the rectum and the rest of the colon. And then the newer procedures or the newer surgical approach to this disease is called a primary or resection with primary anastomosis. And when we think about that, what happens is we have our area of diverticulitis right here. Once again, we cut out above the diverticulitis and down to the rectosigmoid junction. But this time we actually take this descending colon and we hook it up to the rectum right away. And usually we then take a portion of the ileum and create an ostomy there to prevent the fecal stream from going past the repair. And that's called a 
DLI or diverting loop ileostomy. So what that typically looks like is you have one barrel of your ileum here, the other barrel here, and this is the abdominal wall. So you've got, essentially there's a division made in the ileum right around here, and it's just brought up to the skin. So there's one aspect that diverts the fecal stream. This other aspect doesn't really do anything. Um, and you're able to catch the stool contents in the bag, just like your typical ostomy, but you have two barrels and it's your small intestine as opposed to your colon. And the advantage of doing this, why people switched from the Hartman's to trying this type of procedure is it's actually much easier to take down this ostomy than it is to take down a Hartman's proce procedure. And the reasons behind that are a little bit advanced for medical students, but if you can just imagine that here you have both ends up close to the abdominal wall, so they're right next to each other, you just dissect them out, put them together and drop it in. You can imagine that that's probably a lot easier than it is to go down to the rectum and find this rectal stump that's healed and scarred in amid all this inflammation. And so people that have this second type of procedure have a much lower rate of uh, still having an ostomy at one year after their initial surgery. So in practice, uh, you may see either of these. I'd say they're both considered acceptable by surgeons today. Usually colorectal specialists lean more towards this primary uh, anastomosis approach and uh, general surgeons typically lean towards the Hartman's procedure in my experience, but that is what they're debating if you hear that come up. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about here is how do you decide where to resect when you're doing surgery? So we got our worst colon yet. Uh, but the, the key point to remember is that wherever the inflammation happens, you actually just feel where that is with your hands. There might still be diverticula more proximal, but you don't have to take these out unless they're part of the diseased part of the colon because you, you want to leave people with as much colon as possible. So you just find where the inflammation happens, cut right above that proximally, and then distally you always want to go down to that rectosigmoid junction to take out the rest of that sigmoid with those high risk diverticuli. All right, so that is all we wanted to talk about today. Of course, there's a lot more that goes into diverticular disease, but I hope that this pathophysiology, this background, thinking about that small outpouching, plugging it up and how that infection can lead to um, the further complications of diverticulitis should give you a good background to help you understand the more complex presentations, like when that infection progresses to a fistula, going to maybe the bladder uh, or other bowel, or when recurrent diverticular disease happens over and over again and leads to benign strictures, potentially bowel obstructions, things of that nature. But if you want to hear more about those, feel free to ask us in the comments. Uh, this video is for educational purposes only, not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. We'll see you next time.